the Lord is here. Amen. Uh, do keep your Bibles open there to uh, Psalm 85. Beautiful psalm. Thank you, uh, Suzanne, for reading that psalm for us today. And uh, let me just pray. Heavenly Father, Lord, we love your presence. And we ask for you to come more powerfully, more beautifully, more wonderfully, for Jesus' sake. Come, Holy Spirit. May the word of God captivate our hearts and our minds. May we be transformed today in the power of the Holy Spirit and in your word. So, Father, we come. We come. In Jesus' name. Amen. Well, I'd love to share my heart with you about something that's very dear to my heart, and that is the subject of revival. And today we're looking at the theme of how much we need revival. Uh, and this is something that I've been praying over since I was a teenager, really. It was a long time ago. Uh, and, but I do feel at this time many churches, and I've talked to a number of churches, church leaders, at this time, and a lot of people are struggling at the moment. A lot of people are struggling to reconnect at the moment. Uh, I'm I've been talking to a number of people who feel a bit flat, who feel a bit discouraged, who feel the kind of emotion and the struggle of all that we've been through, and it's not easy. Uh, life is not easy for a lot of people at this time. And I just sense that one of the things the Holy Spirit wants to do in the picture that keeps coming into my mind is of a spark, you know, like a spark plug, where the, the engine fires into life, and the spark that is needed for that to happen. And I just wonder whether for a number of us today, we need a spark from the Lord, a spark plug to ignite us again, and to reconnect us to God and to one another. And we need revival and that picture of the spark plug, you know, has been with me for a while. And, and I've been praying into it for myself. I've, been, I've been also been uh, kind of doing some writing recently. And as I've done that, I've been looking back in my own journal where I kind of note down some of the things the Lord's been saying to me. And as, I've, as I read that through a number of years now, there's one theme that seems to come through. And I, I've, it's funny when you look back at your journal, just what you notice uh, sometimes, and one of the things I've noticed is the, the statement I keep repeating, <laughs> and it's simply, and this is just for me, is in my journal, but I keep saying to myself, I need revival. I need revival. I need the spark of the Holy Spirit. Uh, and I think there's a number of us here today, I hope all of us, who would say, me too. I want that. I want more of God. I want to see more of God than I've ever seen before. Uh, and God is so good. He's such an awesome God. I think there's such a beautiful sense of the kindness of God here with us today. His tenderness, his compassion. There's that invitation Caroline gave at the beginning and, and through the words Colin had of come, come, uh, come all who are thirsty. And today, friends, I'd love us to come for a fresh meeting with God. <clears throat> to come that that encounter with God that changes everything. It is, it is so true. When you meet the Lord, he changes everything. And we need that fresh. It's no use looking to 20 years ago, 15 years ago, when we were close to the Lord at that time. Now is the time. Now is the day. If anyone hears my voice, open the door. Now, today is the day of the Lord's favor. And uh, it's and something else so true. When we feel our weakest, that's when God steps in. And a lot of us might be feeling quite weak and feeble, but actually that's the time for the Lord to step in. That's the time for the fire of God to ignite in our souls. It's the time for the love of God to increase in our lives. That's the moment for the cleansing from sin. If you know that you have sinned, uh, the Bible says, you know, if we confess our sins, God is faithful and just and will forgive us. 
I think there may be a number of people who perhaps for one reason or another are carrying around sin and shame and guilt for one thing or another. But the Lord just says, come to me. If we, if we confess our sins, God is faithful and just and will forgive our sins. There is forgiveness. There is cleansing at the cross. And it's wonderful. Uh, this, um, uh, this man, Roy Hessian, who I'll tell you more about in a moment, he saw the East African revival in the 1940s. Uh, and he talks about revival as simply being the life of Jesus poured out into our hearts. That's revival. Uh, he said revival, sometimes people think of revival as like blowing the roof off the church. Actually, it's when the bottom falls out, that's revival. <laughs> you know, Jesus said, if a seed falls into the ground and dies, uh, you know, it abides alone, but then it produces much fruit. Revival is when you get like Isaiah, who saw the Lord in the temple. He said, woe is me, for I am undone. You know, some of us might feel a bit undone this morning even, but, you know, when we see the Lord, when we, when we know God, when we encounter him in his holiness, in his love, in his grace, his awesome glory, when we see God, oh God, I am undone. I'm a man of unclean lips. Lord, my eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. And that's when God sends us out and we see revival in our lives. We, and I, I, I long for a church where we can all see God in a deeper way and know him in a deeper way. So this psalm, Psalm 85, is a psalm of restoration, a psalm of revival. It says, uh, uh, it's, it's really a psalm of return from exile. It's a psalm that came when the people of God came from Babylon uh, back into the promised land, back into Israel. If you like to put history next to it, it's Nehemiah. You know, when they're bringing the people back into the land that God gave them. But the people are a bit depleted. The people are struggling. There is a broken wall. There is a temple that is in ruins. And so it's not a kind of jolly picture of rest restoration. It's a struggling picture of restoration. It's a depleted picture of restoration. And maybe that's how we might feel. But into that picture, God, gave, God has spoken uh, through the psalmist. And there's three things I want to share about this longing for revival uh, from this psalm. The first one is that revival rests on the gospel of grace. And, and, and just let's read these first three verses. You, Lord, showed favor to your land. You restored the fortunes of Jacob. You forgave the iniquity of your people. And covered all their sins. You set aside all your wrath and turned from your fierce anger. And it's so good that this is how this, the psalm starts. It's a psalm of revival and restoration. It starts from a place of grace. And this, the good news for us today, uh, as, as we heard already, God loves you. The grace of God, the unmerited favor of God is towards you. None of us are worthy of that. None of us are good enough. You know, the Bible says all our righteousness is like filthy rags. So none of us can earn this grace. It's totally free and, and, and given. It says the Lord, uh, Lord, you, Lord, have shown favor. And God has shown favor to you today, brother or sister. He's shown favor to you. The grace of God is with you. You can know the Lord by his grace and through his love. Uh, there's grace. There's also restoration. You restored the fortunes of Jacob. Uh, I love that song. You restores, he restores my soul from the Psalm 23. And there is restoration for all who are hungry, for all who are thirsty, for all who are in need today. The restoration comes through Jesus, through coming to Jesus. All I can do today is point you to Jesus, where the restoration comes from. To kneel at the foot of the cross and say, Lord Jesus, have mercy on me. Uh, I did that this morning in my own home. I knelt down and prayed, God, have mercy on me. Lord, give me clean hands and a pure heart. We all need that. There is restoration today, friends, if you'll come. 
Uh, there's also forgiveness. You forgave the iniquity of your people and covered all their sins. I know so many people who feel so unworthy, so full of shame and guilt and condemnation. Today we have a gospel of grace that can deal. His blood has made the foulest clean. His blood avails for you and for me. There is no stain in your heart that the blood of Jesus cannot cleanse and wash whiter than snow. If today you feel you're cut off, you're separated, you're, you're, you've done something or you've just wandered from God and how can I ever get back to God? Friends, his blood cleanses deeper than any stain can go. Any guilt, any condemnation, any sin, he, he makes us clean through his precious blood shed on the cross. Isn't that good news? We can all walk out from church today free with a clean conscience washed white through the blood of Jesus. That is such good news. Isn't it wonderful? I love the, I love the theme of the blood of Jesus because I depend on the blood of Jesus. Not, you know, not, I have no righteousness of my own to boast about, and neither do you. It's simply through his love and through his precious blood. And then also, we have rescue. It says also, you set aside your wrath and turned from your fierce anger. And praise God that at the cross, there's an old word, an old-fashioned word used, propitiation, which means that at the cross, the wrath of God that should have been ours was put on Jesus. And he suffered and died alone under the wrath of God so that you and I could know the, the welcome of our Father who loves us so much. Even though we've rebelled, even though we've gone far from God, he pardoned a rebel like me. Isn't that wonderful? Amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. I once was lost. Now I'm found. <sighs> Sorry. No, 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 no. You don't need to clap. Sorry. I'll just get it together in a second. <sighs> the grace of God. nothing oh there's nothing that we can do that, that, that stops us him from loving us uh, yeah and I, I you know I know oh, there's plenty in my life where I've needed to depend on his grace and his love and I just want all of us today nobody is excluded the, God, the, the revival rests on the gospel of grace and it's when we get our minds and our hearts really around the gospel and the love of God and his grace freely given that, the heart, his, that our hearts burn within us, that others would know that and that we share his love with others. And it's all at the cross. It's all at the cross. It's all at the cross, uh, friends, today. So that's where revival takes us, to Jesus, to the cross, back to the cross. That's where we come. And that's the first thing I'd like to draw your attention to is this gospel of grace. The second thing that revival does is, uh, or the, 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 the emphasis here on is how revival is obtained through prayer. Uh, it's, it goes on, the psalmist goes on and says, restore us again, God, our Savior. Restore us again. Do you hear the psalmist praying does that prayer restore us again, O oh God, our Savior? I can hear the passion. You can hear the urgency. You can hear the depth of longing in that prayer. And put away your displeasure towards us. Will you be angry with us forever? Will you, um, will you, prov um, sorry, will you prolong your anger through all generations? And then this beautiful prayer. Will you not revive us again? that your people may rejoice in you. Show us your unfailing love, Lord, and grant us your salvation. These are beautiful. These, this, if we want to learn how to pray, 
You can learn through the book of Psalms how to pray. Because here we have an intercessor. Here we have someone who's longing to see God at work. Uh, there's not, you know, we want, don't we, to see God at work. Uh, we've seen so much of our efforts. Uh, and now we want to see God move among us. Colin was praying about uh, see, seeing the signs and the wonders of God. And the greatest sign and wonder ever is a soul that comes to Jesus for salvation. And then we also see the beauty of healing and, and forgiveness and reconciliation and all the wonderful signs of the kingdom of heaven on earth. So beautiful. There's nothing like the kingdom of God. It's, uh, it's the pearl of great price. You know, we should give everything up for the kingdom of God. So beautiful. And one of our values as a church is living for the kingdom. And sometimes we live at such a low ebb rather than living for the kingdom of God. We live for our little kingdoms rather than his glorious kingdom. And Jesus has a, a kingdom that he wants us to live for. Revival comes from God. It says, restore us again, God our Savior. We're looking to God for what, all that God wants to do among us in his power. It's not going to come from us. It's not going to come from organization, rather through agonization. Uh, it comes through the Holy Spirit. Uh, I always remember uh, the first stories I heard about revival was the, you know, and I've, I've probably told this too many times, but Christine and Peggy Smith from the Isle of Lewis, you know, the older ladies who prayed and prayed because they had a vision from the Lord. There were churches with no young people in them. And those ladies caught a vision for prayer. That's how they could respond. And so they prayed. For four months they prayed. And they prayed till the early hours of the morning. Got down by their beds and prayed. And God heard them. God answered their prayers. Uh, and hundreds and thousands of people during that revival came to Christ. And the churches became packed with young people. Isn't that amazing? God heard the prayers of two old ladies. I think that's wonderful. And God hears our prayers when we come to him humbly and in the fear of the Lord and in the love of God, he hears our prayers. And God will hear our prayers. Did you know that the, one of the greatest revivals in 1859 where a million people in, on this, in the UK and also many in the United States became Christians. It all started, that massive move of God, in one small prayer meeting in a village in Northern Ireland. It's, it came out of one prayer meeting. And sometimes we believe our prayers are just so impotent. Uh, you know, where can my, it feels like our prayers just hit the ceiling. But, you know, friends, God is the God who answers prayer. He is a covenant-keeping God. He keeps his promises. Um, and I, in this book, I brought a few books with me because I think there's nothing like reading the accounts of people who've experienced revival. This is a book called Sounds from Heaven, and it's eyewitness accounts of the Hebrides revival. Uh, you know, the, it talks there about those, those elderly ladies. It talks also about a young man who's a teen teenager, 16-year-old, called Donald MacPhail. That's a good Scottish name, isn't it? And uh, Donald was a real intercessor, even as a young person. And I just love that as well, because God is not interested in age or generation span. You know, you can, the Spirit of God came on the elderly and on the youth at that time. And he caught such a vision. They were in one meeting where the preacher was struggling because the meeting was hard going. And there was disruption. Seven drunk people came in at the back of the meeting and were disrupting. And Duncan Campbell, who was preaching, stopped his sermon, and he saw Donald McPhail at the front, who the Spirit of the Lord was moving in him. And he said, Donald, would you pray? And so the 16-year-old boy got to his feet, and he prayed. And in his prayer, God gave him a vision. And he said, in his prayer, I'm just recounting what he said. He said, uh, he, his prayer, he said, I see the Lamb, Jesus, in the midst of the throne. And he said, oh God, there is power there. Let it loose. 
And they said that it was like a hurricane swept through the meeting. And all seven of those drunk men at the back were saved that night. <laughs> and many of them actually became leaders in the church going on from that because they were soundly saved, born again. The Spirit of God swept in like a hurricane. It's like the day of Pentecost. Friends, that's what we need. The power of God. If you're, if you're like Donald and you see, as we see the thro- at the throne of God, there is power. May God release and let loose his power. Not just in this place. I'm thinking of the high street and the communities and the town here of Loughton and Epping Forest of those 130,000 souls where we need this, the hurricane of the Holy Spirit to be poured out upon us. It is possible. God can do it. And, and, and if, you, if, if that fuels your imagination, that you know, another book I'd recommend is Revival Fire by Wesley Jewell. And in this book, he gives, he gives summary accounts of lots of awakenings and revivals. Uh, through not only in the UK here, you know, going back to Wesley Whitfield, uh, Jonathan Edwards, uh, but also, um, you know, in different countries, whether it be China or Korea or India. There's been so many outbreaks of the Holy Spirit through the years, and it's a wonderful book to ignite your faith uh, as well. This one's also by Roy Hessian from the East Africa Revival in the 1940s, uh, which I've just started to read. Uh, there and I'm loving that one but uh, a revival is obtained by urgent prayer urgent prayer is put, uh, the closest I've ever really seen to this when Caroline and I were at university around about 1994 I remember uh, I was the prayer secretary of the Christian Union then and we used to gather for prayer packed prayer meetings with such an atmosphere of the kingdom and heaven in that room and people would just cry out to God and there was a season that we went through at university when people were just becoming Christians at Reft Light and Center and it felt like prayers were just being answered and there was such a, an atmosphere of eternity in everything. It was like God was everywhere. That's the closest I think we've ever, I've ever seen and I think there's so much more than that uh, because of what I've read, because of what the witness of the church through the years And so let's catch that vision for the dynamite power of prayer. Prayer, to kneel, is the place of advancement in the kingdom of God. It's not not how busy or the programs that we can produce. It's the prayers that we offer where the power is. And uh, may God lead us to pray. And then the last thing, uh, we've, we've talked about the gospel of grace. We talked about urgent prayer. And then this psalm also describes for us the result or uh, that, that revival results in transformed lives. Um, here's the description that we get in Psalm 85 of God's restoration. The, the psalmist says, I will listen to what the Lord says. Just this, I just want to f- stop for a second when he says, I will listen to what God the Lord says. That's the most important thing about us is what is God saying to us. Not your circumstances, but what is God actually saying in the midst of the circumstances? We, we're very good at listening to the, the tape in our head about our circumstance and our problems. What is God saying about that? I love the psalmist when he says, I will listen to what God the Lord says. Uh, he promises peace to his people, his faithful servants. He let, he, uh, but let them not return to folly. There's the repentance. Surely his salvation is with those who fear him that glory may dwell in our land. Listen to this. Love and faithfulness meet together. Righteousness and peace kiss each other. Faithfulness springs forth from the earth and righteousness looks down from heaven. The Lord will indeed give what is good and our land will yield its harvest. Righteousness goes before him and he prepares and prepares the way for his steps. And what I read there is just the beautiful description of the kingdom coming and transformed lives. You read there of peace. So many people today are we're living in a crisis of fear, helplessness, hopelessness, isolation, 
uh, of people who are so in a flat spin, really, in their emotions and their hearts and their spirits. And Jesus, Jesus is the Prince of Peace. And of the increase of his government and peace, there will be no end. And as Christians today, we have direct access. Not, you know, peace is not just a concept. It is a person, the Lord Jesus Christ. He is peace, the Prince of Peace. And peace, you know, this is one of the first things here. Revival, revival will bring peace. Peace with God, most importantly, and peace with one another. They had, uh, one, of the, one of the feedback c- comments we had a lot in the survey that was taken in the church, and we will come back onto that soon. Uh, don't worry, we, we haven't forgotten about that. But was a desire for fellowship and love, to love one another in this church. I thought that was wonderful. May we, we want to be a church where we love one another and there is peace between us. Um, when I've spoken to people from revivals, one of the things they said to me is the reason, one of the reasons the meetings went on so late into the morning, two, three o'clock in the morning. One lady said to me, it was because we couldn't bear to part company from one another. The fellowship was so strong. The sort of bond of the spirit and the bond of peace was so real that people, you, you just don't want to go home. Don't you want that? I want that. You know, it's more than just pull our socks up and try to love each other a bit better. That's a gift of the Holy Spirit. When the Holy Spirit comes, fellowship. They gave themselves to fellowship, the peace of God resting on a community. That's so attractive. No wonder you don't have to advertise a fire. You know, that's so attractive to the community. They want that. We want that. And revival transforms lives. And peace is one of the ways it does it. And then also there is salvation. It says there, uh, uh, surely his salvation is near to those who fear him. Uh, this meant, that's why, again, the gospel is right at the center of revival. Jesus. I know we've, we've spoken about that already. But also love, look, he says, love and faithfulness meet together. Righteousness and peace kiss each other. These four beautiful things. Revival will bring love, faithfulness, righteousness, and peace. Doesn't our world, don't, don't we feel so dry and like in a spiritual desert, longing for those things? Righteousness, faithfulness, love. We're like in a parched land. It's like that sort of whenever you've been really, really, really thirsty and you need the drink, as Colin was bringing that word of us today. Jesus says, you know, it's, when we drink of him, we drink of righteousness, faithfulness, peace, love. That's what our world is calling out for today. And also goodness. Uh, it says the, the good uh, salvation, faithfulness springs up from the earth, righteousness looks down from heaven. The Lord will indeed give what is good. Isn't that wonderful? In our time, the times in which we live, the hand of the Lord longs to give good things. That we may know his love, his, his grace, his favor. And then it says, we're coming here to an end, but then it says, and the land will yield its harvest. Many people will come to Christ. Hundreds and thousands. Are we getting ready for a time? You know, we're all going to be needed for discipling people left, right, and center to, to, to share the gospel and to lead and disciple people who come to Christ. This is the kingdom of God transforms lives. Revival changes lives. And in the state of our nation today where truth is something that is totally subjective rather than something real and true. Uh, Where uh, there's so much poverty and addiction and violence and fear in our world today. Don't we need righteousness and faithfulness and love and peace? And even in the church, as we look around the church in the UK today, you know, it's, there's a grievous sort of redefinition of the gospel happening, which is kind of just a, a sticking plaster Jesus 
really, rather than a full gospel that, that we need. And there's so much consumer Christianity, self-centered uh, approach to faith, uh, relativism, even in the church, uh, ethics, the ethics of the kingdom of God. You know, we're now calling good evil. Uh, you know, that which is good is being called evil, and that which is evil is being called good. It's not right. And the Lord wants to bring his kingdom in so that we will again see righteousness and holiness and purity and love again established. That's what happened. In Wesley's day, England was on the verge of the same kind of revolution that happened in France. And the only thing that didn't that turned the tide was the revival that took place. That's what changed society. In, after Wesley died, 72,000 people had become Christians. And then in the few years that followed, it multiplied sixfold. Isn't that remarkable? In Wales in 1904, 110,000 people uh, became Christians. That changes society for the, for the better. And we re realign ourselves. Has anyone felt the grief in your heart of how our world is rebelling against God in so many different ways? This is the way back. It is through an awakening and an outpouring of the Holy Spirit. So transformation of society, salvation for eternity. But it's summarized in that one statement, verse 6, that I want to leave you with. Will you not revive us again? Will you not revive us again that your people may rejoice in you? That's a beautiful prayer for us to adopt and say, Lord, will you not revive us again that your people may rejoice in you? Amen. May we stand together. May we stand. Father, you are the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. You are the God of Elijah. You are the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. You're the same God who poured out your spirit on the day of Pentecost. And in the name of Jesus, Lord, we cry out to you in our day and in our time. Lord, in your wrath, remember mercy. Lord, move, we pray. Lord, will you not revive us again, O God, that your people may rejoice in you. Heavenly Father, we pray. We pray for the gospel to take root in our community. We pray that the presence of God would be everywhere. We pray, Father, that you would lead us to urgent prayer. Give us the spirit of prayer. You said my house would be a house of prayer for all nations. And Father, we pray for transformation in lives that are so lost without you. Father, send your spirit, Lord, for the glory of your holy name. And we pray, Father, that you would give us unity in heart and in action and purpose in prayer. Father, come Holy Spirit, we pray. So just to take a moment now, friend, brother, sister, and give your response to the Lord. Give your response to God. Begin, it might be today, friend, your response is to say, God, have mercy on me. Wash me clean. Lord, I've been half-hearted. Lord, I've been dabbling in so many things that are not your kingdom. Oh God, have mercy on me. It may even be that there's someone here today and you've never given your life to Jesus yet and you need to become a Christian today. Say, Lord Jesus, I believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and I repent of my sins and I turn to you now and I give you my life. And maybe some of us here today need to come back and you say, Lord, give me that spark of the Spirit again. Lord, light in me the flame of the Spirit. And I pray, let that flame grow. Spark me into life, Heavenly Father, by your Holy Spirit. And God, we pray, pour out your spirit of prayer, spirit of repentance and faith and love. Revive us again, O oh God. Revive us again. It's time for you to work, O oh Lord. Lord, this must be the time. It's time. 
for, to see a demonstration of the Spirit's power. We pray, come Holy Spirit. Just make your own response to God in your own heart now. Thank you, Lord. 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 Come, Holy Spirit. Let us be people of prayer. Let us sense that the, the main thing the Lord wants to do is call us to prayer. Call us to prayer. Let's come together, even on Tuesday night. Let's come together to pray. You're in your own home, getting, getting a place to pray in your own home. But to pray and to pray and to pray and to not give up. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Father. Sow the seeds and the sparks of revival now in our hearts, we pray. Let it come, O oh Lord, we praise you. Let the showers of blessing fall. We are waiting and expecting. Lord, revive the hearts of all. We pray this, Father, for your name and your glory. We want your glory in our land, O oh God. Hallelujah. Amen.